Um, thanks very much, Dr. Allen. Um, so thank you all for giving me the opportunity to speak today. And I spent the last couple of weeks trying to look into a crystal ball of what I expected the future specialty would be um, with the onerous task of potentially going after one of my former masters and my current NSD who suggested I speak and I dare not say no because I value my future in the profession itself. Um, so I suppose there's a bit of overlap with um, what I've put into my slides and what Dr. Ogan has already uh, discussed. And she's touched on the National uh, Women and Infants Health Programme because that's the most recent um, change that it was launched in January of 2017. And also based on that, we have the National Maternity Strategy and the Benign Gynecology Working Group. So some of my talk today is going to uh, focus on gynecology. I'd be glad to hear Dr. Carr. Um, and it's very important because we have huge waiting lists, both at outpatient and surgical level. It's aiming to attack staffing issues and also service organisation. And we know that in, to improve the services, to provide this service of the future, that we need to increase consultant numbers at almost double over the next six to ten years. And in order to do that, we need to increase trainee numbers also. So we have a changing demographic in our population. This is no secret. We talk about it quite regularly. And I think that demographic is going to continue to change. Um, we have an advanced maternal age. Women are delaying maternity due to professional, personal, financial or social reasons, or there may be medical reasons. Um, and I suppose in the most recent past, the maternal age in mid 40s would have been on the higher end, but we are now seeing women into their late 40s, early 50s, and case reports of women in their 60s and some in their 70s having um, uh, children through IVF in other countries. We're also seeing increased obesity trends, um, and we feel that this is going to continue unless we do something serious about it. I think there's a discussion about um, lifestyle changes in the afternoon. There are women with chronic medical conditions and through the advent of medical care, these women are living to reproductive age. They are achieving wellness to um, achieve fertility and reproductive capabilities. And we have to be able to care for those women. And I suppose you would expect, it's reasonable to expect that this will continue into the future. But also we're seeing a patient population that have increased education. They have more awareness about their own conditions. And there's a, a, a wealth of access to information on the uh, World Wide Web through social media, um, through um, internet access. And women are coming to us with um, suggestions of treatment that we may not know much about. They're reading things in magazines that they've heard celebrities advocating for and they're seeking those treatments. We've already discussed increased litigation and the payouts that happen. Um, but when you look at Ireland as a country, it's not the most litigious um, from a general point of view, but from a medical legal point of view, certainly uh, we're seeing a change in that. And I think generally the discussion has been about trying to uh, provide a fund for those families to be able to apply to so they can pay for the services for their children, as opposed to having to fight through courts to get compensation to be able to provide what their children need in the home. And there's zero tolerance for adverse outcomes. Um, we cannot, unfortunately, guarantee that everyone who comes into the hospital will have a positive outcome, a positive experience. Um, but it's very um, unacceptable to the general population to consider that maternal death might occur or that neonatal death might occur. Um, and I think we have reduced the maternal deaths probably to as low as we could potentially get them. Zero would be fantastic. Um, it's not 100% possible. But also I think we need to start focusing on morbidity as well as mortality and looking at reducing the morbidity as a result of complicated pregnancies and deliveries. Likewise, our healthcare professional demographic is changing. So we have increased graduate entrant medics. Um, we have people going back to do medicine in their 30s and some in their 40s. And that comes with, with it an additional financial burden because the fees for those individuals to study medicine um, can be quite high. They can come out of college with more than 100,000 euro worth of debt. Um, and if they're advanced in age, they may already be settled. They may be married. They may be in a serious relationship. They may have families. They may have a mortgage. And then they have this additional burden from a professional and a, a, a financial point of view that they have to deal with going forward in their careers. Recruitment and retention is the big buzzword at the moment. It's been discussed, I think, yesterday at one of the uh, presentations. And when we look at the creation of consultant posts, um, it can take nearly 18 months to approve a new consultant post. Then you have to advertise, you have to interview, and you have to appoint. So it could be maybe two to three years before 
a brand new consultant gets into post. Um, we have a huge issue with our brain drain and doctors emigrating. And traditionally, our doctors went to other countries such as Australia, America, New Zealand, Canada to do a two or three year period of training and a fellowship or research with a view to come back and bring those skills back with them. But last year, there was 300 visas issued to doctors specifically going to Australia to work. And within the college, Dr. Neve Humphreys has been doing very um, excellent research, uh, looking at why doctors leave and whether they plan to come back and why that might not be the case. And she has a four-year period of research underway. And she interviewed people in Australia and found that more than 50% have no plans to come back to Ireland to work. And the majority of them cited barriers to doing their job, such as staffing, overcrowding, patient waiting lists and access to investigative tests as the main reason why they didn't feel that they were able to come back to Ireland to work. They did mention work-life balance and on a large scale, financial reasons was, was the lowest reason why they cited not coming back despite the disparity in the new consultant contract. So what kind of services did I feel that we might be focusing on in the future? Um, Obviously, you'd have to live under a rock if you had missed that the Eighth Amendment was repealed. Legislation was recently signed by our president and on the 1st of January in 2019, which is maybe only, I think, nine, ten weeks away, I'm oh, sorry, ten, eleven weeks away, um, we will be expected to provide this service. And this is no insult to anyone in the, the audience who is involved in designing the service or coming up with the planning of the service, but the public and the profession are asking the questions. Who is going to deliver the service? where is it going to be delivered and how is it going to be delivered because we don't have that information at this moment in time and it, it, I suppose it's quite concerning for a lot of people that this is coming very soon in the future and we're not set up for it yet. At the moment IVF treatment in this country is largely private based healthcare. Um, I think we need to move to look at fertility and reproductive capability as less of a luxury and a lifestyle choice and more of a, I suppose, a human right or capability because a lot of fertility issues are caused by real pathology. Endometriosis affects one in 10 women and there's a delay in diagnosis by up to 10 years for a lot of patients who just resign their painful periods or their cycle pain to their normal. Um, there's also pelvic infection, which may have long-standing consequences. And those patients, those young patients who go through cancer treatments early on in life, which may um, mean chemotherapy, radiotherapy or surgery, which can leave them infertile or subfertile. And then there are those with congenital abnormalities um, and uterine development abnormalities that are unable to carry uh, pregnancies to term for particular reasons. IVF is costly on a financial basis. Um, it's costly emotionally and it's costly socially. And it's quite difficult for patients who may not be able to afford to attend a private clinic. There are very few clinics that provide any funding or support, one of which is in, in Dublin uh, attached to Hollis Street. And of course, there's the Rotunda IVF, which does limited um, public funding and the Cork Fertility Clinic, which provides um, intermittent case-based funding as well. But to say to those couples that there is nothing for them when they have pathology and pelvic disease that has rendered them infertile just doesn't seem good enough. But I do understand that in a, in a nation at the moment where we can't quite fund cancer services, it's hard for people to, to line those up when it doesn't directly affect them. I think in the future we need to look at those patients that are seeking gender realignment. Um, it's, I suppose, an evolving specialty um, and I think those patients are able to access potentially the endocrine and the hormonal treatment quite well. Um, they can access the psychology and the psychiatric support quite well. But from a surgical point of view to complete that transition, most of that care is provided privately and it's self-funded and it's expensive. So those patients are seeking, um, obviously, f female to male transition, um, and we can perform non well minimally invasive keyhole surgery to remove the pelvic organs for those patients. Um, and then they have minimal scarring, so it's able for them to carry on in their life in their chosen gender. A little bit controversial to discuss cosmetic gynecology, but I think it is something that needs to be considered because there's, with social media, there's a lot of focus on what's the perfect body type. Um, and young girls are being referred increasingly to gynecology clinics with concern about their labia and about how their vagina looks, um, which to me growing up wasn't something that our friends talked about or even thought about, I don't think. But 
girls are coming in saying their labia are too big and they want them to be reduced surgically. And that can have long-standing consequences for them if they have any complications. Um, also, there is transvaginal laser treatment or the Mona Lisa treatment for one of the brand names to use. Um, it's initially been uh, put out there by celebrities who describe it as vaginal rejuvenation or vaginal youthening um, for those who have vaginal relaxation syndrome. And that's generally through childbirth, um, increased capacity and laxity. But also there is some evidence that this may help those patients who have pelvic organ prolapse and urinary incontinence. And at the moment, that is only available privately to patients who pay quite a large sum to attend a specialist who will do that. Um, and it should be provided by specialists because there have been reports of complications such as burns or fistulas for people using those technologies that don't quite uh, have the full training to do that. And I think particularly at the moment where we have no mesh insertion, mesh is on pause, so we can't do transobturator or transvaginal tape insertions for urinary incontinence, that this may be something in an alternative for women who don't want to take the risk of the, the surgical option. So just to briefly look at training, um, Dr. Rogan mentioned EWTD. Um, it's well established and there's a varied application throughout different units. Um, but certainly when you have a reduction in, in hours and a reduction in exposure, you will find that you, those skills that are practical skills um, and competency-based skills are going to suffer. It also makes sense that when you have an increased number of trainees and the same number of patients, that that exposure is divided out amongst more people, so you get less exposure to particular procedures and training. So how do we address that? And Dr. Ogan has mentioned um, simulation courses, and the RCPI have set up a laparoscopy course here with an EOSIM and a lapro trainer, which they actually give you the EOSIM briefcase to go home and practice at home. Um, and that's expensive to run, um, but it's very useful for the trainees, and they all appreciate and feel that their skills develop drastically as a result. Result. There are the wet labs and the cadaveric course in the ASSERT centre in Cork was mentioned. I've been to it. Um, I'd highly recommend it to anyone who is practising laparoscopy. It's an excellent course. But there is also other courses available that um, are not so much human anatomy, but there is a live pig model course in the IRCAD Institute in Strasbourg in France. And I've been on that course as well. Um, so comparing the both, they have advantages and disadvantages, but I think both together provide um, an excellent opportunity to practice surgical skills in a safe environment. But I think going further and looking at the technological advances that we have, we could use digital surgical education. And there's been leaps and bounds in virtual reality simulation and augmented reality. So virtual reality is 100% computer generated, um, whereas augmented reality is computer generated images lured onto existing uh, reality and through that you can practice surgical skills you you do have to wear the the headpiece and the the goggles um so it is a bit strange to get used to but there's some really impressive programs out there um that would simulate the environment before actually practicing surgery or um, performing surgery on a patient under direct supervision of a consultant who's training you and then we come down to resilience. Um, we're all concerned about the attrition rates amongst the, the trainees. We're concerned about burnout. And can you actually teach resilience is the answer to the, is the big question. Um, the answer is, I personally don't know. I think if you get through medical school and you get through your intern year and you've managed to, we say, survive, which sounds like a terrible way to describe it. But if you get there, you probably have implied resilience. But obstetrics and gynaecology as a specialty, um, it is quite unique. There are acute emergencies at the drop of a hatch. You might have multiple emergencies at any one time. We are exposed to traumatic experiences on a regular basis and you have to pick yourself up and carry on through the rest of your, your shift, whether it's a 16 hour call or a 24 hour call and treat the rest of the women that you come across that night as though that other incident hadn't happened in a way. I don't know if we can teach resilience, but I definitely think that we need to um, come up with some coping mechanisms that we could each, we're, we're generally a good support network for each other. We debrief each other on a regular basis, but that's quite a, an unofficial um, thing that we do for each other. And I think we need to signpost more uh, for trainees where they can go and what they can do if they're struggling in the specialty because then they risk burnout if they don't. And we lose some really excellent trainees out of the specialty over the past few years because of um, traumatic experiences that they may have had. 
So moving on to the positive, I think Dr. Rogan mentioned the good, bad and the ugly. I'd like to do the good, bad and the brilliant. Um, when we look at innovations, their technology is moving in leaps and bounds. Um, we have the e-chart in maternity now in, launched in four units and it's going to roll out across the, the country over the next few years so that in any of those units, a woman can arrive and you can access her health record. Um, you're not relying on the paper chart, which she may not have with her. And that has positives for the clinician as well as positives for the patient. Um, and St. James's Hospital has rec recently launched their e-chart as well. We talk about robotic surgery. Um, I'm showing my age a little bit here if you're aware of the Cybermen, anyone who knows Doctor Who. Um, I think people think of a robot performing surgery or this little android guy. But actually what you're dealing with is a stack um, with multiple arms. Um, oh, sorry with multiple arms that's actually taller than me, so I'm about five foot four, it's quite big, it's quite ominous looking, and it has five robotic arms that insert through laparoscopic ports. And then the surgeons are sitting in the top left, you can see the surgeon sitting in the corner looking at the screen, which is looking at the camera, and they are using essentially joy pads um, to operate the, the operative arms and the camera to be able to perform the surgery. And the Da Vinci robot is now into its third inception where it's going to have single port uh, surgical arms where it have one port in the abdomen and smaller arms will come out so it'll be only one access point for the patient and one scar. Other innovations, then we look at uterine transplants. So there's been a number of uterine transplants over the last few years, and there have been successful pregnancies. Um, and last year, BMFMS, we all heard about, the, we were blown away by the technology of baby in a bag. Um, and we all wanted to know what that presentation was going to be. It was essentially um, the delivery of an animal model, a preterm lamb, pre-viable, that was then placed into a box and provided with the appropriate um, environment to be able to gestate it towards term and then it was delivered from the box and they showed us video footage of the lamb running around the lab seemed to be perfectly normal the brain scans were fine and the idea of that was that if they had women who were extremely unwell and need to be delivered at a pre-viable stage that they could deliver their baby and then have the baby in an environment and gestate it to closer to term so that the baby would survive and the mother would be uh, treated. I think you kind of think it's a bit sci-fi and it moves along with the, the matrix kind of style of babies in pod and humans being developed ex utero. And I think in the next few years, we might start to see case reports um, and their research if they've moved on to human models. But I also think we need to ask ourselves when it comes to science and technology, just because we can, does that mean we should? Um, it's definitely an ethical conundrum. Um, and that's one for the ethics boards, I think, and generally the society as a whole. Uh, we have three-person embryos now, so women who may have mitochondrial disorders, they can take the, the maternal egg, remove her uh, nucleus with the DNA in it, and put it in a donor egg with that DNA destroyed so that there's healthy mitochondria, and then take the father's sperm and do IVF. So that's essentially genetic material or, you know, kind of, the, the mitochondria from a donor, the genetics from the mother and the father, and it's a three-person embryo. And that will eradicate most mitochondrial disorders that are known about uh, going forward. Antenatal diagnosis um, in the back in the day was based on ultrasound. Um, ultrasound machines get better all the time. But now we have invasive tests such as placental sampling and um, amniotic fluid sampling. And the more non-invasive test, which is groundbreaking, where we can do whole uh, genome sequencing and diagnose single gene disorders. And now, when we, um, in two units in Ireland, we're doing um, fetal blood typing as well. So in Cork now, women who are rhesus negative have NIPT to take cells of the baby out and we figure out what group that baby is to find out does she need anti-D or not. So it's targeted anti-D therapy. But unfortunately, most of these screening technologies are available through private companies and um, patients have to pay the cost and they may not necessarily have the appropriate follow-up or support if they have a diagnosis that they're not quite prepared for. And all of these technologies generate big data and big data is a new thing and there's talk of using artificial intelligence to design algorithms which will be able to aid decision making on patient care but this of course re requires quite advanced computer power and may require cloud storage we could see the, the computer storage areas and data storage banks popping up all over Dublin for Amazon at the moment um, and that may be something that we need to invest in in the future. Media focus has been mentioned by Dr. Rogan and it certainly is something that uh, trainees think about when it comes to staying in the specialty or applying for the specialty and we've had a difficult relationship with the media over the past uh, probably 40 years 30 years um, and we, you can name the, the the media scandals as they're portrayed chronologically 
Um, and I think, you know, the most recent um, discussion about cervical check and mesh use, it, it does hit hard on people because we feel we go into work to help our patients and then you feel like you're being bashed all the time. Um, and I wondered, was it really all that negative? So last year I presented um, a media study where I looked at a tabloid and a um, broadsheet both in UK and Ireland and looked at the content and unfortunately overall when it came to the, the broadsheet the, the, most of the content was either negative or neutral and um, there was very little focus on policy in the papers and in the, uh, the tabloids it was very superficial it was all about celebrity bump watch essentially. So I kind of asked her, myself can we steer the coverage and guide its tone? It's difficult to do because Good news doesn't always sell as well. Bad news definitely sells. But I think it's important that as a specialty going into the future that we positively engage rather than the, the usual neutral approach or silent approach. And I think we've had some programs and documentaries over the last few years that have looked at maternity services. There was the Cork From Here to Maternity, um, Hollis Street had midwives, and the most recent Rotunda documentary, the, the feedback from the public about the daily realities of maternity services actually quite um, heartening and there has been quite a lot of positive feedback. I think there's only been a few negative uh, criticisms of the language used maybe on the labour ward um, or the way people refer to, um, to patients during their time on the labour ward. Um, but I think that's heartening and perhaps we need to engage more with programmes like that in the future um, to improve the perception of our specialty. Brexit probably needs a whole extra day to talk about. I don't think anyone really knows what Brexit is going to look like from an economic point of view or a financial point of view. Um, but we do have a close relationship with the RCOG in the UK. They provide guidance and support to um, the consultants. Many of our, all of our consultants are members of the, the Royal College of Obs and Gynae and some are fellows. Um, they also supervise fellowships and training. And we attend the college at times for exams and courses um, at our own choosing. But also you have to think of medical supplies. Yeah, medical supplies um, and the logistics that that might um, pose problems with. So in summary, I think if I was to be able to say what I want, it would be improved state-of-the-art services for our patients and improved state-of-the-art training experience. And I think there's a positive feedback mechanism there. But ideally, we want a well-funded, adequately resourced, women-centred women's health service. And we ask ourselves, is that the unicorn? Will we ever find it? Um, but I think now we look at finance, and that's what we need. And in the last budget, we have an extra 700 million given to healthcare with ring fencing for extension of the HPV vaccine, funding for the termination of pregnancy services, and a commitment for the development of action plan for women's health. And I look forward to hopefully being part of the consultant body that delivers on that plan going forward. Thank you.